Hey, welcome back everyone. Today we'll be discussing Bloom filters, a probabilistic data structure in computer science that's all about saving space and time. Think of them like a basket where you can put elements inside. However, you might expect to be able to look inside the basket later and check if an element is present, but you might be greeted with a nasty surprise. Hey, Bloom filter, have you seen my apple? Maybe. Well, that's not very helpful. Think of Bloom filters as similar to the worst possible romantic partner. One where if you ask them if they love you, they'll only respond with no or maybe. And in this case, I'm not sure which one is worse. So in this video, I wanted to explain why Bloom filters are so useful, how exactly they work, and then finally, we'll actually implement one ourselves through a tiny project written with some simple Python code. You're probably thinking to yourself, if they can never give me a definitive yes, when are Bloom filters ever useful? Consider your web browser. Each time you visit a website, it checks a list of malicious URLs to ensure that you don't encounter a virus. If every computer had to query a central server like Google's for each and every site request, the servers could become swamped, leading to frustrating delays in loading your favorite sites. So the alternative would be to maintain the entire list of bad URLs on your local machine, consuming valuable storage space. Enter Bloom filters. They can keep a compact, efficient list of these dubious URLs on your device. In exchange for the reduction in space, they introduce some uncertainty. When you navigate to a site, the web browser quickly checks if the site is in the Bloom filter. If the Bloom filter says no, we can trust that the site is safe with 100% certainty because it's not on the list. A no lets you proceed immediately. But if the Bloom filter says maybe, then that triggers a more thorough verification. This could mean reaching out to a central server for a deeper check. While that might take a little bit longer, it's a rare inconvenience compared to the overall time saved by avoiding needless checks for the vast majority of safe URLs. Databases can also use Bloom filters to quickly check if a specific key is present before running an expensive query. If the Bloom filter returns no, you just saved a lot of time. But if it were to return a maybe, can still proceed with the expensive query that you were going to run anyways. Their strength is speed and efficiency, so a little bit of uncertainty may be a worthy trade-off depending on the circumstances. We'll see later how we can actually make this trade-off ourselves, which is nice because in some cases, accuracy is more important, while in others, it may be speed. The goal of the Bloom filter is to be as lightweight and compact as possible, so it doesn't take up too much overhead when checking for no's and maybes. So how exactly does it achieve this? The Bloom filter comes in two parts hash functions, and a bit array. A hash function is a function that takes in a value and converts it into a hash, which seems like a random number. The biggest thing to note is that every time we pass in the same input, we're guaranteed the exact same output or the exact same hash. There is no randomness involved. Another way to say this is that hash functions are deterministic. A couple more features we'd like from our hash functions is that first, we want them to be fast. The whole point of Bloom filters is to speed things up, so slow hash functions kind of nullify that. We also want our hash functions to have uniform distribution and be independent from each other. I'm not going to dive into what exactly these look like, but if you'd like to see a video fully dedicated to hash functions, let me know down in the comments. The bit array is very simple. It's just an array where each element can only be a 0 or a 1. So now, let's see how combining these two concepts yields the power of Bloom filters. We'll start off with a bit array of size 10 with all of the bits set to zero initially. I also have the index positions below the array. Next, we have two hash functions. The first one simply returns the number of letters in the fruit's name, and the second one returns the number of vowels in the name. Just a disclaimer, these are horrible hash functions to use literally anywhere outside of this example. The only requirements that they fulfill is that they're deterministic and fairly fast. We'll use legit hash functions when we implement the real Bloom filter later in this video. So let's start off by inserting the fruits kiwi and raspberry. Kiwi has four letters and two vowels. This is why we set the bits at index position 2 and 4 to a 1. Raspberry has nine letters and also has two vowels. So we set the bit at index position 9 to a 1 and keep the bit at index position 2 the same. Note, we never ever set a bit back to a 0 once it's been set to a 1. You can't ever delete items from a Bloom filter. We'll see why in just a sec. So after our insertions, this is what our Bloom filter looks like. Now, let's look up some fruit, starting with banana. It has six letters and three vowels. Because the bits at those positions are not one, we know with 100% certainty that we have not previously inserted banana into our Bloom filter. 
Mango has five letters and two vowels. Even though there's a one at index position two, index position five is still a zero. So we again know with 100% certainty that we haven't inserted Mango before. As long as at least one bit is a zero, we know for sure that our bloom filter has not seen that fruit before. Also, once we receive all of the hashes for a fruit, it doesn't matter what value came from which function. We only care about setting the bits at each of those positions to a one if they weren't already so, not in any particular order. Now, things get really interesting. Let's insert pineapple, which has nine letters and four vowels. Because of kiwi and raspberry, index positions four and nine have a one at them, even though we've never inserted pineapple before. This is called a false positive and is exactly why a bloom filter cannot ever return a definitive yes, only a maybe. Coincidentally, pineapple's hashes lie in the union of the hashes for kiwi and raspberry. Same story with an item that we have inserted before. If we try to do a lookup on kiwi, we'll get four letters and two vowels, both of which have a one, but that's not enough for the bloom filter to return a yes. It doesn't keep track of the actual items we've inserted, only the bits in the array. So it doesn't know if the two and the four were set to ones because of kiwi, a previous fruit, or by some combination of previous fruits. For example, if we had inserted pear previously, its hash values would have also been two and four. I mean, the whole point of a bloom filter is to not have to keep track of the exact fruits that we insert, which is why the small trade-off in certainty for efficiency is one that we're willing to make in some applications. This is also why we cannot delete items from a bloom filter, because we don't know if the bits were set to a one by multiple insertions or by just the one we're trying to delete. In this case, the one at index value two represents both kiwi and raspberry. So deleting kiwi would result in the bloom filter thinking that raspberry was never inserted. This may seem like a terrible trade-off that we're making right now, but we can reduce the odds of false positives by either increasing the size of our bit array or by choosing more and better hash functions. So now let's actually implement a bloom filter ourselves to use in a spell checker. Assuming our list of English words is exhaustive, if the bloom filter returns a no, we can assume that the word is misspelled. If it returns a maybe, we can either run a more thorough check or just assume that it's spelled correctly. I'll leave it up to you guys to decide. And as usual, all the code from this video will be linked down below in the description. In order to create our spell checker, we need a large list of English words. This GitHub repo has exactly what we need. We'll put these into our bloom filter. But given that this list has over 370,000 words, our two measly hash functions and a bit array with 10 slots probably isn't going to cut it. Our bloom filter would return maybe way too often, which defeats the purpose. The good news is that we have a couple of equations that will tell us the exact number of bits our array should have and how many hash functions we need. N is the number of elements we expect to insert into the bloom filter, which in this case will be around 370,000. Let's say we're aiming for only a 1% false positive rate, which means we'll set P to 0 0.01. K will be the number of hash functions we need and M is the number of bits in our bit array. A higher tolerance for false positives means more space savings, but at the risk of getting more maybes. The first equation gives us M, given N and P. The second equation takes in the bit array size and the number of elements to calculate K. And then we can use the final equation to check our work to see what the false positive probability is given N, M, and K. To put things in perspective regarding storage efficiency, our text file containing the word list is slightly over 4,000 kilobytes. This size includes some overhead from new lines after each word and potentially some data from the file system, but it's not much. In contrast, our bloom filter after solving for M would require just over 3.5 million bits or around 443 kilobytes, since eight bits make a byte and 1,024 bytes make a kilobyte. This 90% space reduction demonstrates the efficiency of bloom filters, especially when dealing with large data sets. And the crazy thing is that this percentage has the potential to get even better as the size of our data increases. These theoretical values only work in practice if our hash functions meet the requirements of uniformity and independence mentioned earlier. I can't speak for you, but that means any hash function I personally come up with probably won't cut it. Thankfully, there are Python libraries that come with off-the-shelf hash functions that meet all of our requirements. Python actually has its own hash function too, but its output changes between runs for security purposes, so we won't be using that for today. The two libraries we'll be looking at are the MMH3 and FarmHash libraries. The former gives us the murmur hash, 
and the latter is a family of hash functions from Google. The nice thing with these hash functions is that we can pass in a seed, allowing us to generate a diverse range of hash values from the same input. This flexibility is crucial for Bloom filters where multiple independent hash functions are needed to minimize the probability of false positives. By simply changing the seed value, we can use the same hashing algorithm, murmur hash, or a function from farm hash to behave like multiple distinct hash functions, thus efficiently utilizing these libraries for our Bloom filters. And as long as we use the same seed value, our hash functions will remain deterministic, which is perfect for us. Here are some sample functions from both the MMH3 and the farm hash libraries. Great, now let's write our Bloom filter class. For our imports, we're going to use an optimized bit array from the bit array library, the Python math library, and the hashing library of your choice. Our constructor will take in the number of elements we expect to hold in our Bloom filter, along with our desired false positive probability rate, with a default value of 1%, represented as a decimal. We'll use the equations from before to get the optimal size of our bit array and the number of hash functions. Note how we set all of the bits to zero initially. At the end, we'll use Python's list comprehension to create a list of however many hash functions we need, each with a unique seed. Here are the simple changes you would need to make if you wanted to use farm hash instead of murmur hash. Whichever one you choose won't affect the rest of the code. Now, let's move on to the insert and lookup functions. For the insert function, we iterate through all of the hash functions, and for each one, we pass in a string, modulo it by the size of our bit array, and then set that specific index position to a one in our bit array. The modulo ensures that we don't have an index value greater than the size of our bit array. The lookup function is also pretty straightforward. We again iterate through all of the hash functions and for each one, we pass in the string, modulo it and check if the bit at that index position is either a zero or a one. If you remember from before, if even a single position is a zero, then we know with 100% certainty that this element is not in the Bloom filter. However, if all of them are one, then we're not so sure. So we return a maybe. Let's finally get to using our new Bloom filter class. Let's read in the text file with our English words and insert them into our Bloom filter one at a time. Next, let's read in a massive list of French words. I've already filtered this list such that there are no words in the French list that also appear in the English list resulting in a final list of over 300,000 French words that our Bloom filter has never seen. We're going to look up each of these words in our Bloom filter, and the goal here is to measure how many false positives we get. While I said that we were creating a spell checker, using words from a different language is probably easier than generating 300,000 misspelled words, and it serves the exact same purpose. So we create an empty list to hold our false positives and iterate through the filtered French words and look up each one. Every time the Bloom filter returns a maybe, we know that it's a false positive because this word was never originally inserted into the Bloom filter. Finally, let's print out some analytics about the performance of our Bloom filter. Because of some rounding, our theoretical false positive rate is slightly different than our desired false positive rate, but we can see that our actual false positive rate aligns pretty closely with this number. And again, the key thing to note is how small our Bloom filter really is relative to the size of all of the data we put in. That's the magic of Bloom filters. Here's a quick graph of how the size of the Bloom filter scales with the desired false probability rate. It's a logarithmic relationship. If we desire a 0.000001% false positive probability rate, we're still experiencing about a 50% reduction in space usage. One final graph I wanted to show is the potential space savings as the size of each of our data points increases. Let's say we went from inserting words to user IDs in a social media app, which means each data point may go from just four to seven bytes to up to 64 bytes. We're assuming our data set still contains around 370,000 elements, just that each singular element is more bytes. As we can see, the graph nears 100% space reduction, which perfectly illustrates the true potential of Bloom filters. Bloom filters are an incredibly unique data structure because of the uncertainty they introduce to speed things up. I was skeptical at first about their viability, but only after learning more about them did I learn about their true potential, which I hope I was able to share with you guys today. Thank you so much for watching today's video, and I hope that you learned something new about Bloom filters. Maybe it'll help you look at your web browser or spell checker slightly differently next time. But if you have any questions or comments, please let me know down below. I'll see you guys next time though. Bye-bye.